Hey everyone, it's Nurse Danny coming to you live today and I have Dr. Marcella Smid with me today. She's a perinatologist and researcher and she's done so much great work in Utah. I'm so excited for all of you to get to meet her and to talk about, about a very important topic we have today. Opioids, dependency, addiction, and how it affects women. So um, tell, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm, and why this is why you're vested in this topic? Yeah, so um, I'm a like I said perinatologist. Um, there's of course in medicine we have 14 different names for all the same thing. So I'm either a high risk obstetrician or a maternal fetal medicine doctor, or however you want to say it. Um, but my subspecialty is um, women with addictions, um, and so I run the University of Utah's specialty prenatal clinic for women with uh, any pregnant or postpartum woman with substance use issues, and it's called SuperAd. It's Substance Use and um, Pregnancy Recovery Addiction Dependence is what our acronym stands for. And I came to Utah two years ago um, for a um, job in MFM because I love the mountains. Um, I always say I'm a, I'm a ski bomb with an OB problem, and <laughs> it pulls me away from uh, my job. I love my job. we have lots of babies here. Yes, so. I have, it's a great, Utah's a great place to be an obstetrician. Um, and I came billed as an obesity researcher. And so that's what I thought I was going to do here. And I did my fellowship, my MFM fellowship at University of North Carolina um, in Chapel Hill. And we were required to get wavered in buprenorphine so we could prescribe Suboxone to our pregnant moms. Um, and we all just by virtue of training there had training in perinatal addiction. And it was just part of the curriculum that you got as a as an MFM fellow because you're high risk because we do high risk so that's oriented. part of mm -hmm. the thing that we take care of is mm -hmm. um, it's a chronic medical condition like any other so we had a very um, well-developed curriculum in that and when I got here I was the only provider in our um, base at the University of Utah with a waiver and within six months my clinic had essentially become this Indeed, clinic. clinic the and um, because before you, there were any resources. Uh, there was. I mean, there were people did the best they could, um, but there wasn't a, a, a specific program or specific home for these for these moms. And um, so when I got here, we um, essentially I started seeing these women, and in about six months, I realized that I um, wasn't doing it the way you should do it. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there's an, a, this is an interdisciplinary problem and it needs not just an obstetrician. You need a whole host and a whole team of people to take care of um, pregnant women with any substance use issue. And so I went to our department, um, to my boss, and um, Dr. Aaron Clark said, great, let's start it. And so we did. And our first day of clinic was August 4th of 2017. So Superad has turned one year. We now have, we joke my, I run the clinic with uh, my PA Jasmine Charles um, and she and I are very much partners in this um, process. And we say now um, we have a one-year-old baby that we sometimes can, <laughs> that one of us can go, she's on vacation right now. So I'm single parenting um, the <laughs> clinic right now. And it's actually manageable now. So it's much like having a one-year-old. You're like, oh, I can, we can kind of sleep through the night. When it was one month old, it, we were not sleeping through the night, but we've, um, you know, we've it's really, it's been, it has been the, the gestation of the super rad clinic has happened and we are one, we were very, um, proudly one years old. And what's, what was really great. We were just reflecting on this, that a year ago, there were five of us at the, uh, at the table and it was myself Jasmine, my my um, MAs, and then an addiction fellow. Um, one of the the uh, addiction medicine fellows rotate, and addiction psychiatry fellows rotate with us from the University of Utah. And last, so last week we had 15 people at the table because we've just had. Now we're truly an interdisciplinary team, and we have representatives from social work. We have case management. We have Connecta Health. Um, oh, I lied. Connecta Health was there. There were six people. Connecta Health has been with us the whole time. Um, we have. Um, USARA, which is a peer support um, group here in the Valley that come and they're there so women don't have to go to 15 places. They this, this speaks to how far we've been able to come having conversations yeah. about this. Yeah. I have a vested interest in this because my dad mm -hmm. and also another close relative both passed away because of addiction mm -hmm. to opioids. And it ultimately was their demise. And <clears throat> I think I mourned the loss of him mm -hmm. years before he died because of the person mm -hmm. he became. Mm -hmm. And we tried to get him help. And this was like 10, 15 years ago when no one talked about it. No one mm -hmm. understood this problem. And there were absolutely no resources. Right. And we would try to call pain clinics and his doctors and talk to him about it. And 
No one said, mm -hmm. did anything about it. Mm -hmm. And now people are talking. Now mm -hmm. we're seeing resources. And I am mm -hmm. so grateful for that because these are lives we're talking mm -hmm. about. These are families that we're mm -hmm. talking about. And um, anyone out there who is who's had problems with it or who may mm -hmm. know someone with a problem, I want them to be able to know where to go mm -hmm. after we have this exactly. discussion. And then I think you're exactly right. So I think especially when I when I give talks or I talk to anyone about addiction is that there is no way you, you this hasn't personally affected you. There everyone be just because of the epidemiology of addiction is that it is a chronic medical condition and just like diabetes, you know someone with diabetes. You know mm -hmm. somebody with addiction. You may not know that you know them. And the face but of it you know them. I love those billboards yeah. that we see all across the yeah. Wasatch front that say this is the face it's, of addiction mm -hmm. uh, or op opioids. And it's, you know, it's grandmas, it's moms, That's it's exactly the right. person next door. It doesn't have to be someone who's, you know, shirking in the shadows. Mm -hmm. It affects everyone. So patients um, look just like you and me. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So um, we had a little conversation before mm -hmm. we started today about how um, women in particular mm -hmm. react to opioids and how they get hooked. Expound on that. So women, um, there are some really important gender differences between women um, and men in terms of getting, be developing an addiction. So women, um, especially with opioids, if they are exposed to opioids for whatever reason. So we are, pers you know, women are prescribed, people are prescribed opioids for pain issues. That is what it is. It's a pain medication. Um, back pain, pelvic pain, endometriosis, headaches, migraines. Those are the most common reasons. Um, and women tend to, um, are more likely to actually develop dependence and addiction faster than men. That's an interesting fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and we don't know why. We don't actually know why. We know that that's, um, that, if relationship exists, but we, we don't, where our research is too early and there's lots of money that's now, like you said, the conversation mm -hmm. is really moving forward. Um, nationally, we're having that conversation and locally we're having that conversation and on the national level, the National Institutes of Health are really starting to pay attention to this and money is being opened up um, in order to study why do we have this problem? Yeah, because it is a problem. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> how? So you said most women are introduced because of chronic pain mm -hmm. issues. Women are also prescribed narcotics when they have a baby. Yep. What percentage of women go on to develop a dependency or addiction after taking those? I think it's important for women to understand that they're, uh, they, when they're prescribed to you mm -hmm. and you use them appropriately, the risk is minimal, but mm -hmm. there is a risk. Exactly. Um, so about, it's still a very small number. So many women, for example, will have a C-section. So in the United States, walking into the a U.S. hospital, you have about a 20% chance of having a C-section for whatever reason, uh, an, an obstetrical reason. And one of our mainstays of medications is narcotics. Um, and you, as, as you mentioned, used appropriately, um, there, the risk is, is quite small. But there's a, about 2% of women will develop a dependency, and that may move on to an addiction. When we're talking Utah numbers, mm -hmm. the number of women who have children, 2% is actually it's, a lot. There's a lot. Yes, we are. We are. A, mm -hmm. We are the highest um, birth rate state mm -hmm. in the country. We make we make lots of babies. Yeah, we do. So there's lots of exposures for women. Mm -hmm. And that's like each time you have a child okay. and you're prescribed that, it could mm -hmm. present a problem mm -hmm. if it's not used appropriately. So you, and you we actually have the highest prescribing in the, for Medicaid for women covered by Medicaid. We are actually twice the national average for being prescribed opioids in pregnancy. So our uh -huh. Our numbers are four. So nationally, it's about 20% of women will be prescribed opioids while they're pregnant. And for us, it's about 42%. Do you think that kind of goes back to the fact that there's an expectation a patient may have um, when they go to the doctor, they want to walk away with a quick fix, like a pill? I mean, and the doctor's willing to do that? It's hard. I mean, it's hard to say because every patient's different and every patient's need is mm -hmm. different. So that's a... Um, some legitimately we, need it. Absolutely. So there's some. There's there are some people who... The rest of that, you know, the, the most important thing is to review in is risks and benefits, right? We can't tell mm -hmm. you what's going to happen to you f definitively. What we can say is these are the benefits of the med medication and these are the risks. And you get to make an informed choice as to whether that's something that you want or not. And I think the important thing that we're realizing more and more is that any exposure to opioids, there are some people who have a biological underpinning of their brains that they're more susceptible to developing an addiction. And you can't really tell by looking at someone mm -hmm. whether they are or not. It's actually like, di it's much like diabetes, mm -hmm. right? So you can look at your family history. And if your family history is, 
you know, generations of people who have diabetes, you have to be more careful than the person who doesn't about gaining extra weight because you're more likely to to get it. Mm -hmm. As we're talking about, I'm from the Czech Republic. Everyone in my family has diabetes. I will get it if I if I gain weight. Same thing with addiction, right? So if you have a family history and there are many people in your family who have addiction, drugs is probably you have those risks for you individually are much higher than for somebody else. And so you and you can't you can't tell whether or not that's you without mm -hmm. without trying. And maybe that risk is too high for you. Yeah. Maybe the benefits are 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 outweigh the risk, but that's something that you have to talk to your patient about. And so every patient is every, there's. Every patient is different and everyone's circumstances is different. So being thoughtful about it, I think, is the most important thing is really having a thoughtful conversation. And that's not a five minute conversation. That's yeah. often a much longer conversation yes. about what are the benefits and what are the risks. And Intermountain Healthcare is doing a lot to try to mm -hmm. prevent, um, to tr trying to reduce the number of opioids prescribed. Mm -hmm. And so far it's working. If we yeah. look back um, to last year, significantly yep. less opioids have been prescribed. And, and I think the, the benefit of what uh, Minter Mountain is doing is that there's also a lot of opioids that just hang out in people's houses. Yes. Education yeah. about that is huge, too. Huge. And so it might not be you, but it mm -hmm. might be your teenage child who, who discovers the opioids. Mm -hmm. Or it might be, you know, people... It's People see medications and they try them mm -hmm. um, to our beds. I, when I talk to my patients about it, I say, opioids do more harm than guns. And so you should treat your opioids in the same way that you treat your, a gun in the house. Mm -hmm. It should be locked. Up. It should be safe. You should treat, I mean, a small child can, you know, if you get a, a small child gets into your, your opioids, that is a, an overdose yes. waiting to happen. Yes, it's um, so scary. And so we really, we have very um, real and direct conversations about opioids are like guns. Treat them like a gun. And lock them up and keep them safe. Oh, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. So um, when a pregnant mother is taking mm -hmm. opioids, how does that affect the baby in utero? And what effects can a mom expect after the baby's born? You know, I worked on labor and delivery for 11 years. I was an MFM mm -hmm. for two years. And um, we, we had very candid conversations mm -hmm. with women about their drug use and history of it. And I would always just be like, I don't want to judge you. I just want to help you mm -hmm. and your baby. But I can't help you and your baby unless you tell me. But most women are afraid to say something because I have heard this so many times. Mm -hmm. They're going to take my baby away. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to help the baby, we need to know what to look for after delivery, too. And all of that is really helpful. So kind of tell us more about what a woman can expect and what effects it might have. So it's a, it's a great question. So we have, um, we do a lot of talking about what are the, what are the reasons? So first we start with why is somebody on opioids? And it really, that's a, how we're going to approach the issue is really, um, an important question of what are, what are the opioids doing for somebody? Is this a chronic pain issue? Um, if it's a chronic pain issue, then we need to address the chronic pain. Does this per person have an addiction? And those are actually very different, right? So we do a lot of talking about what's the difference between dependence and addiction. So everybody as a human being, the, if you take opioids, you will develop an, a physical addiction, right? 100% of us will. And we um, talk a lot about if you stop that medication very quickly, you will feel withdrawal symptoms. That doesn't necessarily mean you have an addiction. An addiction is a compul is once that there's it's a primary brain process that is there's a compulsive drive with some negative um, repercussion to it. So that re repercussion can be financial or legal or it speaks to what you're willing strain, to do to get it. Exactly a strain mm -hmm. on your relationship. So mm -hmm. that it's and we need to first dissect that mm -hmm. because those two things are related but not necessarily the same thing. So we do a lot of talking about why someone is taking the opioids first for the mom, because we need to address why she's on for moms. What is the reason that she's taking the opioids? Sometimes it's there's a chronic pain issue that we need to address. Sometimes we can address that chronic pain issue in other non-pharmacologic ways. And sometimes we can't. And we have to do a risk and benefit conversation about what we can do in pregnancy and what's realistic. Um, in terms of addiction. Is it better to go off it before you deliver? Or is it better to stay on it or wean? It, it entirely depends, right? So that's, again, a really important question. And it, it, it depends on what is the reason, right? Mm -hmm. So for somebody who has 
chronic back pain. If and it depends on what their goals are. If their goal is to is to reduce the risk entirely for their for their baby, um, then then weaning before pregnancy is off. But you can't take moms away from from their own bodies. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have to address why that, what is the back pain? Is this back pain that we could get under control in other ways? What's a tolerable number? I mean, I'm using back pain because it's one of the most common things, Mm -hmm. but again, I go back to why are we actually, what is it that the opioid is treating? And if somebody has an addiction, you know, the the mainstays of treatment there are replace, are what we call opioid pharma, um, pharma, pharmacotherapy, which is a really fancy word for opioid replacement. So we do that either with Suboxone um, or we do that with methadone. And there's some reason, some different reasons why people choose one or the other. Um, and then behavioral therapy. So it's it's in the same way that diabetes is treated often with insulin or metformin and diet and exercise. You also need diet diabetes and exercise. education exactly. and lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes. Yeah. So I often have, especially with addiction, um, I'll have mom say, well, it's just getting addicted to another substance. And I say, well, it's fair. It's actually not because the difference between, for example, heroin is that heroin has a very quick on So you, f- you feel it right away. So it's up and then it's down versus Suboxone and Methadone are really long acting medications that stabilize your brain because once you're at an addiction, your brain chemistry is actually different and you need to stabilize your brain chemistry. So there's much like diabetes, there's about 10% of people, as you know, who will deal with their diabetes, their underlying diabetes with just lifestyle modifications. And there are some people who are very successful at it, but about 90% of people will need medication to deal with it first. And then they can, as they learn those new skills of di- of lifestyle modification, exercise, di- um, diet, all of those things, which is the same in, in addiction. Right, so we have behavioral therapy, which helps to understand what are the what is that that the drug is helping you cope with, because people aren't stupid. People do things for a reason, right? Drugs are are used for a reason. People use them because they help in a sh- they're a very effective short term sta- strategy for not caring about something mm-hmm. that's really bothering you. It's extremely effective, but it's not effective long term because it's really it gives there's a lot of downsides to it. Yeah. And so we have to address that, those issues. So when we have pregnant moms, we try to dig down into what, what was, what, what got them to the addiction. And sometimes there's a lot of moms have underlying mental health issues that we need to address. There's lots of depression, anxiety, things that haven't been addressed in the past or not, perhaps not in the most um, effective ways. So we do a lot of addressing of, of those things. And so your question of was, was, what do we talk to mom? So if we, first we have to find out what what is going on with mom and why are, why is she on the opioids? Once we do that, then we talk about the effects on baby. Um, and effects on baby, so uh, for opio- any opioid exposure in um, it, when, when a baby is a fetus, so the short-term things that we think about are really, um, it depends on what, again, what, what reason is mom on, on the opioids. If it's something, we don't really know the difference between mom who's on a, on a long-term opioid, right? So a mom who's taking oxycodone um, for her long-term back pain, is that the same as somebody taking heroin? We don't actually know the answer to that question. Mm. So all the best studies that we, we have kind of lump everybody together. And so we can do... The best we can say is we worry about things like low birth weight. We worry about things like preterm delivery. And the thing we worry about once the baby is out is something called neonatal abstinence syndrome, or some people might refer to it as neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. And that's a treatable medical condition that babies have when they are exposed to any substance, um, when it's opioids specific, but it can be any substance where they may feel the symptoms of withdrawal as well. And so that's something that we we talk about what we're looking for, what are the signs. And again, it's a treatable condition, just like diabetes, babies of moms with diabetes can sometimes have problems with low blood sugars. And so we talk a lot about how we watch babies with mom of moms with diabetes very, very closely for their blood sugars in the same way we watch moms of babies who have been exposed to opioids. We watch them for those signs of withdrawal. Back to what I said before, it's helpful if we know because yeah. then we can watch and, and then intervene. We can watch. Yeah. yeah, And so things that moms um, can do um, to really decrease that risk if they're going to be on an opioid um, during pregnancy is not smoke. So one thing we know that's really effective is that risk actually goes up. So neonatal abstinence syndrome, that risk goes up if they're smoking. So smoking is not great for anybody. Mm-hmm. It's not great for moms. It's not great for fetuses. Um, but one thing is really trying to drive down the smoking as much as we can. 
When is the withdrawal typically seen after delivery? Because that was another yeah. thing that I heard a lot. Um, like I'd be in the labor and delivery room and the mom would say, mm -hmm. oh, good, my baby's not withdrawing. They expect them to come out and right away exactly. have symptoms, but it takes time. And so mm -hmm. how long can someone really expect that to take before they see what the effects are going to yeah, be? It's a great question. So about 72 to 96 <laughs> hours is the window where we expect to see babies either give us signs that they need to be watched a little bit more closely or that they that they don't. And not all babies will develop neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so the, we, when we're talking to moms, our moms um, with addictions who are, who are on either methadone or suboxone, that risk is about 30 to 50%. Um, and so moms who are on different, it really just depends on which, which kind of opioid that. they're on. Um, but that's about the ballpark figure. So it's really not it's not all. Not 100%. It's not 100%. So there are some, uh, and it doesn't seem to be related to dose is the other mm. thing that we, uh, we're so realizing. So when we talk about weaning and everything, it's debatable exactly. on whether or not that makes a difference. That's exactly right. So we don't, we don't know that. <laughs> Certainly for methadone, there's convincing evidence that it doesn't, um, that do I've seen, and I've seen that in my own practice. So I've seen moms on very, very high doses of methadone whose babies have no effects. And I've seen moms on pretty low doses of methadone whose babies have withdrawal symptoms. I mean, it, and it, so it's probably a combination of the mom's genes, dad's genes that combine to make a baby's genes, mm -hmm. and then the, the placenta. So the mm -hmm. placenta is also doing a lot of metabolizing. So we don't really sure. know. Yeah. So um, again, it speaks to the importance of knowing because yep. then what if, a, if we don't know, but then the baby went home, exactly. which is typically like a one to two, two day days. period after the mom's exactly delivery, right. but then goes home and has yeah. symptoms. It's important for us yeah. to know so we can watch for that extended mm -hmm. period of time. And so, you know, we, you're hitting on a, exactly a great point. So we, the most important thing is for people to be honest with mm -hmm. their provider so that we can give you education. We can give you understanding about what to and expect resources. and resources to address what's yeah. going on. Um, and you had mentioned it before that people are really, women are really afraid um, that my baby might get taken mm -hmm. away. Um, and we address that, you know, in our, in my practice, in my clinic, um, in Super Ed, we talk about it from the v very early on. We talk about, so in the state That's of Utah. That's usually the number one thing on their mind. So yep. if you can put that out on the table yep. first. Exactly. It's helpful. And so we're very honest about how this process works. So in the state of Utah, once there is, um, once we know that there is any kind of um, illegal use of drugs or um, misuse of prescribed medications, um, we have to make that referral to, to DCFS. And we talk about that very early on. And the goal of DCFS is not, and that's Department of Child and Family Services, is not to tear families apart. That is not what their goal is. Their Absolutely. number one goal is to keep families safe, so mom safe and baby safe. Um, and I think moms don't, yeah. they miss that. They yeah. miss the fact that they are a priority too. Exactly. And so it is, that, that's exactly right, that their job and their mission is to keep families safe. And their mission is truly to keep families together. And there are some families and there are some moms that may need additional help and support before they are able to care for their babies independently. And, and I, working with DCFS, you know, I think that the caseworkers and the, um, are really there to be advocates for mom. Um, and the more honest that moms can be with their, with their and transparent with absolutely. history, current use, everything, everything, um, then the, that's when the system works for moms. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's, it's, it's made, it's a system that's, um, intended to be a resource and to be helpful. Um, and so we encourage moms to be honest with us. We are honest with them. We make that pack, uh, Every time when we first meet a first mom, time mom, we say, we're going to be very honest with you. We just would, like we we um, would ask that you're honest with us because um, that's the best way we can take care of moms and babies. Um, and it's working with DCFS. And so in our practice, we have our moms um, when we know we're going to make a DCFS referral. We have them meet with our social workers who are part of our team um, and they they meet with a pediatrician. They meet with our nurse um, managers and they get a tour of, of a nurse of the nursery that the babies might be at. And for us, that's it's great. not the NICU. Mm -hmm. um, for us, that's an intermediary care nursery if the baby even needs that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're working on a rooming in process right now where the babies actually would stay with mom and because that's mom awesome. is the first line treatment. Treatment. So mm -hmm. we like to say that the, the first line treatment for, for your baby is actually you. So that is the thing your baby needs is to be snuggled. You cannot snuggle a baby too much. So holding skin to skin, breastfeeding, all of those things are I, super yeah, important. I think the mom, again, needs to understand how yep. important she is to the process. Because if she just feels like the baby's going to be taken away and she's just mm -hmm. going to be shunned, that's going to 
she's not going to be nearly as invested mm -hmm. and in moms, the process of helping herself and her baby. Yep, moms and the things we also like to remind moms is they're, they're their baby's medicine and their babies are their medicine. Oh, yeah, I love that. And so it's that, they, they, that they combo. Each other. They need each other. They need each other, for and sure. So being together. And so sometimes moms really struggle um, with relapsing, and there's some moms that really struggle all the way to the end of their pregnancy. And then we have to have a real conversation about whether breastfeeding is the best thing for the baby mm -hmm. at that point. Um, active drug use is um, a contraindication to breastfeeding. It's a, you know, that's a conversation to have with your doctor, with your pediatrician, with the baby. Again, another good reason to be transparent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so on here you said that Utah drug-related deaths are the leading cause of maternal death in pregnancy yeah. and up to a year postpartum. Mm -hmm. This is why this conversation is so important to have. Exactly. So one of my, the I, I say all the time I have the best job in the world, so I get to take care of moms and then the other thing I get to do is to do research. And so now I don't only get to take care of moms in front of me, um, but I view research as the way to take care of all the moms in Utah and moms in and the United come. States and to help and yeah. to help. What is our problem? Mm -hmm. And um, so in Utah, um, our number one cause of pregnancy associated death and, um, and that's up to a year postpartum is drug related. So either accidental or intentional overdose. And there are um, rates about That's 20, sobering. it's 20, yeah, it's 26%. And so 26% in the lat from 2005 to 2014, um, we had 135 moms, um, th oh, I'm sorry, 136 moms die um, of a variety of causes. Mm -hmm. um, of those, 26% were drug related. And the, that's actually the number, the next two leading causes, um, which is thromboembolism, which is either a PE or a clot. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a PE, it's a um, pulmonary embolus, a clot in your lungs, or car accident. Those two combined actually are the same number as drug-related causes. And it's preventable. And it, and it is, exactly, exactly. And so the, and the, the most sobering thing is that Pregnancy is actually probably protective. Moms do such a good job because they're so powerful when they're pregnant um, of trying to do the best thing for the baby. It is a, it's a really, it's an amazing time to, to be a part of because you get to watch someone transform and do things that they've never been able to do. And so moms really, especially moms with, who struggle with drug use, do the best that they can. And if they haven't and, done it for themselves in the past. They'll they try will, to do it for the exactly. Baby. And they'll mm -hmm. decrease their use. And what we're learning more and more is that it's the year postpartum that is the most critical time. Um, and that's the most fragile time in any mom. I mean, now they're any, not pregnant. And right. so they feel like they may be able to go back to yeah. it yet in postpartum depression, yeah. circumstances, exactly. the ability to not overcome this on their own. Sleep deprivation is a really mm -hmm. big one. Yeah, sleep um, deprivation. Yep. So we, um, we talk a lot about how moms are at risk postpartum. Um, and I think that's really where we, where we need to concentrate. We do, we're building more and more services for pregnant moms, and it's really our postpartum moms that we need to focus on. If you can catch them during pregnancy, mm -hmm. though, maybe they'll be then, easier to yep. help in the postpartum period, yep. too. And anticipating that uh -huh. this is coming. I mean, in the best of circumstances, moms struggle. It's hard to have a baby. It's hard to have a newborn. Um, so anybody, all moms in the first year are, are all heroes because they are all struggling. And moms with any sort of substance use issue on top of that need to be warned and educated that if they're struggling, it's their, their risk is really um, much higher when they're postpartum. So what would you encourage someone to do if mm -hmm. A, they are the ones with the problem mm -hmm. and maybe they haven't even told anyone, or B, you know someone who has a problem? Yeah. Uh, what do you do? So a moms who, um, so, you know, obviously this is for everybody, um, but pregnant moms, the resource for us in the Valley is, um, we run the super ad, um, clinic at the, at the U. So contacting us. Um, and then there's always insurance issues that we have to deal with, but we are developed a, a network of providers that are comfortable to, reach out to everyone, no matter what kind of insurance. Exactly. You have. No, yeah. reach out to us and we will help you find a provider, um, that know that is comfortable, um, and provides a non-judgmental space for moms to be able to come so in important. and be able to tell exactly what's mm -hmm. going on and get the get the help that they need, um, and hopefully that they want. Um, and you then, mentioned that you were talking to someone um, not too long ago who was nearing the end of their pregnancy mm -hmm. and hadn't told anyone and came in. Yep. And I'm so proud of her for yep. having the courage to do that. She, I mean, she was right. She was very close to delivering, and she hadn't told anybody about about her drug use. Um, and she did, and she came in, and she was so worried. Um, and we were just so impressed that she wanted to come in. Mm -hmm. I mean, we she 
we we were kudos to yeah. her. I mean, yeah. that takes a lot of that takes a lot of um, bravery. Um, and then for someone who who knows somebody who might be affected, um, you know, it's really it's creating a non judgmental space and saying, you know, this is about you and your baby's health. And it's not about a moral decision. It's not about being strong or weak. It's about addressing a medical problem. And, you know, we, it should be, it, it isn't right now, but hopefully it will be that addiction is just like diabetes and high blood pressure. You don't avoid going to the doctor when you have, mm-hmm. well, Hopefully you don't. Yeah, Maybe you do, right? but in an ideal world, yeah, in an ideal world um, there's much less stigma, I think, about coming in and talking about your diabetes or high blood pressure. And addiction should be the same way. Like it yeah. should just be just another medical condition that you talk about. Because unfortunately, I think sometimes the people who need the help the most have been abandoned by friends mm-hmm. and family, maybe because bridges have been burned in the past. Exactly. And so it is so important to be non-judgmental. Mm-hmm. And if you're the one with the problem and someone says something to you, it's really hard to not react and be mm-hmm. defensive about it. That's exactly right. And so I think it's a two-way street. It's, you know, it's partly the person um, who has the addiction problem accepting it and deciding they want help. And then it's friends and family rallying around yeah. them to help them. That's exactly right. Yeah. So is there anything else that you would like to tell um, our audience today about this issue? Um, you know, I, I think it's so, this is somebody, this is a, an issue that doesn't just affect, you know, I take care of pregnant moms and postpartum moms. But I think this affects everyone. You know somebody with an addiction. Um, there's someone in your life that, that does, and um, kindness is so important and um, really making sure that you're talking about um, using words like, I would... For anyone watching this, I would discourage anyone from 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 referring to someone like a junkie or an addict, um, and really referring to the person because no matter what, that's somebody's friend, it's somebody's mom, it's somebody's daughter, it's somebody's child. You know, child. It's been hard for you to yeah. um, love that person been, up to that point. Think of them as yeah. your if your, your child, your person. your wife, your husband. Mm-hmm. It's like how much you would love that yeah. person. And, and if, if they are that yeah. person for you, and they've rejected yeah. you, that becomes difficult. It I, does. I mentioned with my dad, you know. Um, it was really hard near the end of his life because he had, he had essentially, it had taken over his life and Mm -hmm. we didn't matter to him anymore. At least it seemed like we Mm -hmm. didn't. Um, but in the end, I remember the last time I saw him, we were in a hospital room because they called us and they said, it's, you know, he's, he, this is it. He's going to pass away. You need to come in and see him. So we all went and he was yelling at the nurses because they weren't giving him enough pain medicine. (laughs) Yep. And so I was yep. like, I That's... was like, dad. And I said it just as calmly as yeah. I'm going to say it to you. I'm like, we need to get you help because this isn't you. Please let us get mm-hmm. you help. And he screamed at me and told me to leave. Yep. That's the last time I saw him. So drugs can hijack someone's brain. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that, that's the most, that, that when I started doing this work, I realized that I am incredibly lucky to get to be a part of women's lives um, because drugs can hijack their brain. And the amazing part is that pregnancy and a new baby has the power to hijack it back. I love that. So you can you can really, I mean, this is a, a moment in life when women can do powerful, powerful things. Um, and I'm very lucky to get to participate in that. It's empowering to think yep. of it like that yep. because it's true. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for being Thank with you. us today. Thanks for Shedding me. light on something that, yep. you know, for so many people has brought so much darkness. I hope that yep. people have, have gotten the fact that there is hope for it. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your work that you do in our community Thanks. and that you're doing for those in the future because of your research. Thank you so much We're for having me. We're lucky to have you around I'm, here. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, of, of course, if you guys have any questions, um, you know where to find me on Facebook. Thanks so much for joining us, and we hope you all have a good day.